Hey, I'm Rob McGray. I'm a creative technologist based in Los Angeles, and I'm also the chairman of Lydian Research. This podcast is called Brave New Data, and it's all about helping make data economics and data science accessible to everyone by talking to various folks in various industries about how data impacts their industry and impacts them. Today, we have Victoria Fine. She is the founder and CEO of Finally, and she's got a rich, deep background in journalism and media and all kinds of interesting things that I don't want to steal her thunder. I'll let her talk about. Um, but welcome, Victoria. Thank you so much. It's exciting to be here. Yeah, thank you. So we're excited to have you. I I, I told you before we started, um, you know, journalism is something that, you know, I, I'm not particular. you know, I'm not um, professionally involved with, but um, I consider myself somewhat of a writer or I try to write. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I've kind of witnessed the same thing that we all have, which is, you know, kind of I'm old enough to know pre-internet, post-internet. And, you know, I, I had a paper out growing up and, you know, I had a mother who was involved in politics. And so local news was extremely important in our household. Um, right. And, you know, watching the news at five o'clock when we ate dinner and being on top of everything that was going on in the world. And, you know, I had this belief that over time, the internet was going to provide, you know, more accuracy, um, quicker delivery of news that I would know more and more what's going on. And, and, and for me, I think that in some ways that's happened, but something else has happened. And, you know, clearly we all have seen it that there, there's been, there's been a shift in, in the way that we digest things. Right. And, uh, and I wondered like, you know, from your aspect and you've, you've, you've been involved with Huffington Post, with Slate, you know, you've been on the forefront of this thing. Like what, what is the, you know, what are the major milestones that you've seen happen over, over your career? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say, um, for better or for worse, I, I believe, uh, my graduating uh, college class at the Medill School of Journalism was the last uh, journalism class that actually allowed you to graduate with a degree in newspaper journalism. <laughs> really? Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I was part of that class. So I've also seen a lot of changes in the industry. Um, and uh, through the course of my career, there's been a huge shift from uh, moving from paper to digital to multi-platform reporting and now to creating new kinds of reporting based on data, both from the subject matter and from the insights that you can gain from data. A lot of my career has been using storytelling instinct and data to reach audiences better. Um, and so there's a whole bunch of nitty gritty that we can dig into with that. But I think the biggest um, through line of what I've seen is the rise and fall of journalism organizations that are leveraging algorithms and how content travels online um, to quickly grow and also quickly fall mm -hmm. as uh, users uh, um, change their behaviors yeah. online. Yeah. If, can we step back for a second? And, and I, you know, my question, and, and I don't know the real answer to this, so I'm going to ask because I think you might, you know, if we go kind of back to, you know, late 80s, early 90s, you know, um, pre- pre-internet, internet as we know right. today, like how much data were the news organizations actually able to collect? I mean, when we talk about television, we can talk about like Nielsen ratings, right. and, but how much were they actually able to gather at that point? Yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the most interesting parts of the uh, evolution of digital journalism, because you hear these stories about the newspaper titans falling because of digital. But essentially what has happened is that newspapers um, in particular were built on a model that had inaccurate data mm -hmm. as their um, advertising uh, uh, revenue base. So um, obviously, uh, radios and or radio and uh, television journalism had somewhat of a more specific um, a rating and measurement based on Nielsen and some other methods of trying to understand how often something was played, how many users were tu tuning in, but they were all still fairly analog. So mm -hmm. essentially what they were doing was getting a sample size of users um, and how they were um, reacting to the content on television. So Nielsen, for those who aren't familiar, um, 
was based on the idea that folks would put a Nielsen box in their house mm -hmm. attached to their TV, and then it would track what they were watching. So it wasn't data as we know it now, where you can track every IP address and see what's happening um, with uh, a specific computer. But from a sample size or a, a poll of folks, you could see what the trend was of what they were watching and not watching and extrapolate that. So you had essentially those kinds of measurements for... Um, uh, radio and television media, and then um, newspapers and magazines had circulation. So you had your circulation subscriptions, which were fairly accurate. You could know how many people actually subscribed. But circulation itself was based on a pretty crazy model, which I believe, as I remember, um, uh, average circulation costs weren't based on how many people subscribed but a multiplier of the number of um, publications printed. So your circulation, if you had um, 10,000 things printed, the multiplier, I believe, was three for most uh, local newspapers. And so th the assumption for advertisers was for every one newspaper printed, three people would see that newspaper. So if you had 10,000 subscribers, 30,000 would actually read your paper. So making assumptions, basically. Yeah, which yeah. is, in today's world, ridiculous, yeah. you know. Um, but great for salespeople for yeah. newspapers because yeah. who knows how many people would see a newspaper sitting in a cafe table, you know. And right. so um, they were able to, to really play up journalism's ideals, which is, you know, you read it once and you talk about it with four people and word of mouth is going to get it around. And that's, you know, similar to a billboard where you don't know exactly how many people are going to drive by. You don't know exactly how many people are going to um, pick up that newspaper and read it if you if you leave it in your local diner, for yeah. example. So. So yeah, in short, the the metrics were quite faulty, which is why um, with the rise of digital journalism, you saw this huge crash of um, digital uh, advertising investment. There are some other reasons for that, but essentially these assumptions that had been working assumptions for 50 years um, were not really correct. And it, there was no way to hide that from advertisers as they were making the transition to digital. Right. All of a sudden, you know, you, you, you know, if we're demanding to see like real information, you know, and the assumptions get kind of thrown out, it's like, no, no, I know we thought that three people read, but actually no one read this one. Yeah. And I mean, there, if you talk to folks who are responsible for the selling of journalism, they'll say, you know, the transition from um, print to, uh, to digital was a really hard thing to create a market around because some people were moving from reading a print newspaper to reading it online, then to reading it on their phone. And how do you account for those people? How does that count across the board? Also, if you're an advertiser, um, tangible advertising just in general tends to have a stronger value for traditional advertisers. They want to see something printed out and like changing that mindset to showing um, digital uh, efficacy mm -hmm. of their advertisements was a hard um, brand shift to get yeah. uh, traditional buyers, advertising buyers to make. Um, and so there, you know, it's not, it's not that the media companies were um, making it up and, and completely wrong about how they were approaching things, but there were a lot of things happening at the same time that made that shift to um, digital uh, advertising really difficult. Yeah. You know, I can remember and uh, I, I started in the music industry and then, um, you know, kind of stayed in entertainment for a while. And there was a long time where, you know, if you were in the digital group, it was like second class citizen. Like it wasn't right. quite, it wasn't like legit the same oh, right. way. Yeah. And yet you, you, you would sit there and be like, but wait, we have actual real information. Like, how is this not legitimate? Like, oh, and I know? mean, there, that was also a huge opportunity and a huge bust. Like if you look at how journalism has changed in the last 15 years or so, I was really lucky to, to be brought into journalism and start my career at a time where that was shifting because there, you know, there were a few years in there where people said, oh, you're under 30 here. Why don't you run the digital section of this? Because people just didn't want to do yeah. it. And it was a second class publication. Yeah. Um, and those people are now, you know, the entrepreneurial ones are now running most media publications that you would recognize now. Yeah. Um, but, but I do think that there's an interesting shift that's been happening um, between understanding what part of the digital landscape is valuable. And that's been changing so much more rapidly than the general move from um, 
uh, print or physical publication to, to digital. Yeah. Yeah. I always say, was it like, um, digital provided a lot of us like a side door in, in into the business, you know, that we got to skip a whole bunch of steps and sit at tables that right. maybe we didn't belong at, um, <laughs> cause we had just kind of walked in, but it, it was like, nobody wanted to touch it at the time. And to your point, now you look and it's like, that's the number one. I mean, in some cases it's the only thing. You know, right. like if we think of an, there are many organizations and you can probably list them better than I can, where there is no print component. There is no analog. It's pure digital. And some of them are household names now. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that, that has some secondary effects too, right? Which we talk about, um, speaking to your market, um, in a, in a negative way, you know, if we talk about 24 hour news cycles, and not having to fit something in print and going completely digital. I think the format of moving digitally um, has a lot more to do with some of the, um, we'll call it like sensationalism that people complain about in digital news and and media today Um, because they have to fill, they have limitless space to fill and the trade-offs that, you know, were made 20 years ago are no longer necessary to make. You can update and change um, the primary touch points for a publication a lot more quickly and a lot more easily. So that creates a whole host of other problems. (laughs) Right. right. Corrections can happen in real time. Yeah, exactly. Not just corrections, but just, um, there's, there's no, um, market balance for advertisers to say, um, you know, if there's if there's a demand for what pays the bills versus what's important, there used to be more of an editorial conversation of how much of your publication is going to be, you know, what pays the bills and eyeballs and what's important for users to experience and know about because there's space for both now. The answer is we do both and we do it as fast as we can. I think that's been sort of the leading trend of digital publications in the last several years to increase that growth and, um, and, uh, readership, Mm -hmm. um, to try to match and replace the digital advertising that's been lost. Um, and I think that tide is just starting to shift back now as people realize that eyeballs are not the, the last metric, the, the, the final metric to work with. Right. You know, it's like, um, you you know, you, you, you talk about trade-offs and, um, you know, this idea that, you know, you want high quality and you want accuracy and objectivity, but then you have to feed the masses in a way and you need to have to give people something that they're going to find interesting or tempting or, you know, because at the end of the day, you have to, there needs to be traffic, right? Right. You need, you need to show that, oh, this content and, and, I hate that word, but you know, the story that we're, we're producing this set of stories that people actually want to read them and we have proof. And that's why you want to buy ads because look, this is great stuff. And, you know, but unfortunately, what if the stuff that people want to read isn't those things? Right. You know? Right. I mean, and I think that's where the tide is shifting now. And I think there are a couple of trends that are interesting to look at in terms of how data is being considered in, um, the revenue, um, uh, formats for journalism. If you look at, I would probably say until the last two years or so, um, there was a huge drive both from, um, advertisers and honestly, uh, for-profit VC investors for new journalism organizations to say, we want to see as much of a upward growth as possible on your digital platforms in order to invest in you. And, um, that created that matrix of, um, how much of a balance can we do between what people click on versus what they need to know. Right. Um, and I think some really good examples of that are, you know, early days of Huffington post, there was a ongoing joke of, you know, if it was a slow news day, then you, there was always mysteriously a side boob article. <laughs> 
And there was always this matrix of like no one shares a side boob article, but they click on it. Right. So how many how many clicks do you need versus shares? You know, and so there was there became this complicated matrix of content of like the things that people actually needed to know that we needed to serve them. And and to be fair to Huffington Post, this is something that the whole industry looked at. It wasn't like an internal Huffington Post right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> paradigm that they were following. But you know, there's there's sort of three types of content. There's the clicky content where everyone's embarrassed that they clicked on it, but they clicked on it anyway. And that would drive a certain amount of clicks. Um, there's the share based content, which contributes to virality. So those are things that people are proud enough that they looked at, that they would share with their friends and talk about it, or they're sharing it as part of their personal brand, right? right? right. And where oftentimes we found I worked at Upworthy as well. People would share things that they wouldn't read, but they thought that the idea behind it was like noble enough that yeah. that they wanted to show off on Facebook that they were talking about it. Right? right. And then, um, and then there's sort of the, what you would call broccoli journalism of things that needed to be talked about, but no one really clicked on it, but were the noble causes of journalism that hopefully we all got into. Right. Yeah. So that balance has been driven forward pretty consistently, probably through the last over the last 15 years until the last 12 and um, the up and down of how that was balanced was driven by the platform algorithms that were um, driving the most people at the time. So for a while you would see, um, uh, for example, a lot of um, question based articles that were driven by earlier versions of Google's um, search-based algorithm where essentially articles were answering questions that the public was just Googling. Mm -hmm. um, and that was driving traffic. Later on when Facebook became a real traffic driver, um, <laughs> there was an entire rise and fall of um, video journalism because Facebook was um, algorithmically um, benefiting organizations that posted video to their sites. Yeah, so. so all of a sudden that became a huge um, uh, traffic driver. And that was great for advertisers too, because advertisers like jazzy, beautiful things. So a, vi a video is a much more sexy product mm -hmm. to sell than a banner ad, for example. Um, and you can measure more things in a video, how long people are watching, where they stopped watching, how many times they watched it. Um, you could get more metrics out of that. I think in the last couple of years, people have just sort of hit this wall. And by people, I mean journalism organizations, especially after um, the the algorithmic tanking of news organizations on Facebook, particularly video organizations, because so much money was invested in what you would call an industry pivot to video, um, which is sort of a meme now. People keep joking about it. Um, and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people were laid off in the last couple of years as Facebook moved away from um, supporting video as a primary um, content source. So after that, I think the industry was just kind of tired. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were trying to move into a way to measure um, a measure their success more productively. And I would say now the the preferred measurement is loyalty and subscribership. And if you look at what the industry news is that everyone's tracking right now is how are people attracting and keeping subscribers because they're sick of catering to advertisers. They're sick of catering to VCs who are expecting impossible month over month growth. Um, and so they're hoping that they can retrain the public that it's possible to pay for, um, pay for the information that they need and want. The question there is, is that possible? Because most of us in who have become comfortable with digital news expect that to be free, yeah. you know, and what are they paying for? Because really successful subscriber based organizations are generally driven just as much by the community involvement element of that subscription as they are by the um, content itself. And so that really changes the paradigm of what media is, because usually media is the you know adult that's like, we know what you need to know. And so here's what we're putting on the front page. And so now a lot of news organizations are talking about becoming essentially community management devices and listeners and um, uh, uh, modes of accessibility for the community to do things they can't do by themselves through those organizations. So that will really change what, what media will look like, I right. think in the next few years. So it sounds a little bit like a, a return to 
I don't want to use this word, but I'll use it extreme specialization in a way like, you know, yeah, yeah, if, if you look, you know, it's funny because um, I have this conversation and you probably have it all the time. Like, you know, there's been a lot of concern about uh, HBO and the quality of their programming um, with, you know, their acquisition. Right. Right. And, you know, you look at like a lot of the programming that they do. And right now they've got like, you know, whether it's Big Little, what is it? Big Little Lies mm-hmm. or, or Watchmen right now. Mm-hmm. Or the, these shows just they don't exist anywhere else. And you look at what their competitors, HBO's competitors are doing, which is like Netflix has like, I I don't, they're producing so much stuff and clearly with an algorithm behind it. Right. You know, it's like, you know, Jennifer Anderson plus this, plus wine, plus divorce, (laughs) plus 50th birthday, equal X (laughs) number of views. Like, and you can tell that this is where these things are coming from. Yeah. You know, and it's like, wow. And, you know, I remember, um, you know, kind of when, when something like Buzzfeed came out and they kind of, in my mind, and I don't know if this is accurate, but they came out around the time of like when everything became a list, like seven things you need to know. Yeah. Seven most. Yeah. I would say they probably pioneered that. Yeah. It was Mm -hmm. all, and then everything was a list Mm -hmm. and it was like someone had figured out like, oh my God, if you just make it a list, people read it. They love lists, you know? Well, and I mean, to to take that apart a little bit in terms of how data plays into it. So if we go back to looking at what those, uh, what the algorithmic changes that were happening at the time looked like. So Buzzfeed, um, was one of the first to do this. Upworthy was one of the first to do this. And then there were a couple of other organizations that essentially started as data driven organizations cloaked under the guise of journalism. And I'm not saying data driven as in taking your data, but data as in what works and what doesn't and testing everything, Mm -hmm. which until that point, you know, journalists didn't test anything about their pieces. They put it out there based on what was in their hearts and souls and their good judgment and their 40 years of journalism experience. And then they hope for the best, right? Whereas every other organization in the world was using data in some capacity to improve their products. So um, those early, especially socially driven organizations started looking at every component of an article and testing it. And our work with Upworthy, which um, did a lot of that, I mean, Upworthy, you could say was responsible for the clickbait headline. So I'll apologize for that. But um, what we would do is take uh, socially impactful topics and use data to try to make them more interesting, to get people to click and share on them. Um, And we did that by testing each part of a package online. So um, you'd pick the topic and you'd pick the main points that you would want people to know about that topic. And then you would do a dozen iterations on every part of the rest of the piece. So we would test, um, in the beginning, we would test 25 headlines we would test probably 10 to 15 images. We would test um, different voices for the piece. So one of the um, early things that I did at Upworthy was hire a whole bunch of different kinds of curators with different kinds of voices that spoke to different kinds of audiences. And we would test which social issues resounded with the most amount of people based on the person talking about it. So for example, I remember... um, a lot of gender-based issues would not move forward if you had a woman talking about them, if the curator was a woman with a clearly feminine voice and point of view. But if you had like a Colorado dude talking about it, it was imminently shareable. Right. And so we did a lot of testing to understand how messages traveled online and created storytelling packages based on that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's become a little bit more popular. Um, I think we were sort of at the bleeding edge of that and maybe the worst parts of it yeah, yeah. But, but, <laughs> ended but, up in the rest of the industry. But um, there's a lot you can do proactively in, in getting an important message out there if you become less precious about the the format in which you're telling it. Yeah. I mean, uh, what, what I kind of liked about that, um, you know, you're describing you know, essentially a, a wrapper, the mm-hmm. packaging of it, but you're not necessarily saying we changed the what's inside. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, the, where journalism goes awry is when you stop using the fundamental ideas of journalism, which is 
truth telling, fact, surprising new ideas that push people outside of their comfort zone and boundaries and information that is a service to their daily lives. Like those are the things that I think are really important about journalism. That's why I became a journalist and I became a journalist to help people make better decisions about how they live their lives in a way that benefits the world around them, you know, to be global citizens and not just a citizen of Cincinnati, Ohio, you know, um, I think, I think the problem with, uh, testing and the problem with data is you can, you know, data does not have a point of view. So you can use that in whichever direction you want. So some of those early, pretty cool innovations in terms of how you take a message and you help it reach the largest amount of people were used in kind of scary ways. If you think about what happened, happened with Cambridge Analytica and some of the other political messaging that happened on social later, like those are all based on the same ideas. So you can, you can use use that for good or for evil. <laughs> yeah, no, no. And it's crazy, right? It's like we're seeing, you know, um, in some ways the best and the worst at the same time. Right. Yeah. Right. And I think one thing that people forget when they think about journalism is, um, most journalists have been trained in a very specific format of storytelling because they've been to journalism school and they've worked in journalism organizations. Um, but what they're doing now is competing with a whole world of information that may or may not be true, that people haven't carved out the time to read their newspaper the way that they have in the past. It's whatever time they have um, for 15 minutes on their phone and whatever shows up there, right? Yeah. And so there's a little bit of a hold your nose and look away attitude with a lot of um, journalism organizations in terms of using marketing techniques that and data driven marketing techniques in terms of getting people bought into important stories. Um, and I actually think that's one of the biggest opportunities for data and integrating um, cross um, or, or sorry, uh, like multi-sectoral research into storytelling is understanding psychologically what people respond to and what they don't. You know, we've I've done a lot of work around climate change, for example, and I can absolutely tell you that telling facts about climate change does not change people's minds or actions at all, ever. Right. What does change people's minds is personifying an effect of climate change such as showing what happens to a family or a set of cute animals or um, a place that people can uh, viscerally and emotionally relate to um, and telling stories within that, in that context that get people emotionally hooked and then, and then explaining to them why it's important. Now, is that a manipulation of, um, of people's you know, brains and hearts and minds, it could be, or it could just be fact and and data driven, really good storytelling, you know, with a little bit of backup there based on psychological research and, and testing of what works and what doesn't. I think there's a lot of opportunity there to, um, to improve how people care about the world, (laughs) um, with the modes of, of storytelling that they're already interested in. But I think that that is still a really early, um, exploration of, of how to perform journalism in the world that we have today. Yeah. I mean, that's gotta be frustrating, right. For so many people, because, you know, if we talk about climate change and, um, you know, which is clearly happening and, (laughs) uh, you know, and, and we know how the story ends if we don't change our behavior. Right. Right. It's already happening. Like, and, and, you know, you imagine somebody who's looking at the real data, like, you know, if I'm, if I'm up in like the Arctic and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, we're past the point of no return. Like, why isn't anybody listening? Like, what, right. are, what are we doing as a, as a, you know, what's happening here? And, you know, and, and the folks who are trying to explain what's happening and, you know, how, how are we going to get this across to people? Well, we've got to figure out a way. Right. I think one really good example of that, just in terms of um, how that um, multi, um, disciplinary approach works really well is if you think about the issue of pollution and plastics, which is part of climate change, um, and, you know, a huge environmental issue, um, people still don't recycle, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and there's, you know, uh, 
an enormous amount people could or could not do to, to make a difference there. Right. But if you look at one, one big change that has happened in, um, in plastics and recycling is the straw bans that have happened in the last few years. And I think, um, one of the reasons why those straw bans moved forward so quickly and so well is because there were really clear visceral images of things being affected by that. Like I think that video of like the turtle that had Mm -hmm. the straw up its nose, um, the noises it makes, makes you feel like that's a human. Like there's, there's, if you are a person with a soul, it's very difficult to to look at that and not walk away feeling like you're doing a disservice to to other things on the planet, right? Mm-hmm. And a straw is a very easy choice to make on a daily basis and to tell your friends about. And so I think um I think there's some really clear wins that people have picked up in terms of journalism and um and data-driven solutions where if you can um, make something individually actionable, people will make, will take that action. If people feel like they can attack that and make a difference, they will. Um, and if they feel like they have agency in the situation, um, in something that they can understand and relates to them, they'll definitely do that. And there are ways to measure and create change there. But I think the problem is most of the really big issues that, that uh, great media organizations report on on a daily basis are the progression of huge events and the way that our news travels online right now is primarily event based. So you can keep covering event after event of a major disaster, but that's not allowing people to engage in a different way that will make a difference. So I think the the frustration there is both, um, how do you get people to stay engaged in something that's really important when you have to continue feeding them um, a digital diet? And how do you do that in a way that's not exhausting to the reader and to the uh, person creating that yeah, information? Yeah. And how do you um, how do you continue to create progress on an issue without it being deemed as activism? Because digital. The, uh, the digital platform has blurred the lines between storytelling and activism. And I think a lot of journalism organizations are really struggling with what looks like activism and what doesn't. Yeah. I mean, uh, you, you know, as, as you were talking about the, um, the plastic straws, I, I uh, you know, I was on Facebook one day and I, um, you know, some of my Facebook connections don't have the same opinion that I do <laughs> on things and which is fine, but, but <laughs> this particular guy was posting this, um, you know, basically sharing this thing about how he was so offended that, that plastic straws were being banned and he was so inconvenienced. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and he was sharing like basically, a you know, some kind of story about like, you know, people were, were up in arms and it was clearly like some kind of propaganda that right. somebody had created. But I just kept on wondering like, okay, I, I mean, it's obvious, right. But, but who's going through all this trouble to protect right. the plastic straw? Like, and, and if you, and that's one case, but for every, like what I would call noble crusade or protagonist, there's an antagonist that surfaces somehow now in today's world where, you know, now we want to do this good thing and protect the turtles, but there's some group that, that doesn't care because it's inconveniencing us in some way. Right. You know? Right. And one thing I'll say about that, I had a really wonderful curator who is now, um, a wonderful public speaker, Erica uh, Simon Williams, who her father was a pastor, I believe. And one of the best phrases she ever taught me was the person with the pain has the problem. So if someone is speaking up about something that they that they feel like it's hurting them or hurting their community, it is our job to listen to that and right. not to say, oh, now that you've mentioned it, I feel the opposite way. This is how this makes me feel. You know, the, the sociological impetus of us as a people to, to take a step back and not be morally offended because it hits us in a place that makes us uncomfortable is I think what will make us survive as a human race right, in the long right. run. We're not very good at it right, right. now. No, yeah. it, you know, <laughs> you know, a, a lot of, um, you know, I had a conversation with um, someone yesterday and we were talking about like this idea of being able to look at information with, with empathy. Right. right. And, and what, you know, that lens really changes the way that we decipher or translate the information that we're seeing. And that information could be stories. It could be actual hard data. Like, why is this happening? 
why are we seeing this trend? Why are, why are people reacting this way? Well, and this is what is, I think, you know, my professional and personal opinion on what's scariest about digital media right now, um, is that as, as a country in the U S and in some places globally, we are losing our ability to be media literate. We are absolutely, and, and it's not because we're dumb or because people aren't being given the opportunity to make choices of what they're looking at and what they aren't. But the platform changes that have happened with quote unquote official media and newspapers and TV and radio and, you know, the tinfoil hat people on the street um, or even the fringe people who might have some good points, but come from some like misguided mm -hmm. corners of their arguments. It's all merging onto one platform. And, 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 that becomes really scary when you look at um, how people use that data. I mean, we've talked about, I've done a lot of work uh, with the um, with the U.S. Census and helping um, hard to count communities understand why it's important to participate in the census, for example. But if you take a step back and look at just basic media literacy and how people are understanding their role in the U.S., for example, um, there was a study that came out and I apologize because I believe it was a world Gallup poll, but, um, but I'm not exactly sure which poll it was, but mm -hmm. it came out this week and the New York times was talking about it, um, about how, uh, us, um, uh, young teenagers when they were taking their common core exams, I believe it was, and I'm going to get the stat wrong probably, which is embarrassing on a data podcast, but it was around 14%. It was definitely in the teens of students who could tell the difference between a format of a printed op-ed um, or a printed piece about research of whether or not milk was good for you and a op-ed or like a, a opinion piece by a pro-milk um, advocacy, advocacy organization talking about all the ways milk might be good for you. Right. And the, in the times they were saying, this is so sad that, you know, teenagers can't tell the difference between these two things. This is a failing, failing of our education system. And that's definitely, you know, a part of it, but there's no format difference anymore. There's no, there's no, um, uh, consumption difference anymore between credible news and anything else that you see online. And so that becomes a really big problem when people don't know how to read between the lines of what is reliable and what's not. And that's why you get crazy stuff being shared, you know, on social media yeah. around the world, because it's not because people aren't, it's not because people are dumb. They just aren't savvy enough to know the difference, right. you know, no, and, and we have to teach that now, which we never had to before. I don't know. We, we put a lot of trust in, um, you know, I think we put trust in, in our leaders. We put trust in organizations. We've put trust in, in companies before, uh, and now, and we had trust in, in the media. Right. Right. And I think, you know, over the course of my lifetime, at least you've seen, things that if we're talking about the dairy industry, like the four food groups, right? And we now know that that, that was in part like an initiative by the, the dairy group to, right, to basically right. sell more milk. And, you know, whether it's milk or corn or whatever, if you, if you start to, it, it's easy to get really cynical about this stuff because if you dig deeper, there's always someone that is benefiting from what is being presented as truth. Right. And I think, I mean, going back to, you know, the fundamental probably reason why you wanted to talk today, which is um, revenue and data and journalism. It It's a very stinky topic to talk about uh, motivations for yeah. reporting. And it's a very stinky topic to talk about, you know, people hold their nose and walk away. Um, when, when you talk about that, those boundaries being blurred, you know, and American media has 
I think a unique perspective and not in a good way that we'd like to pretend that everyone is unbiased. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you go to other countries, like I love France because they just declare right up front, like what their opinion is. And they're like, if you don't like it, read another paper, but here's here what we see based on our opinion and what we looked into, which I feel like is actually pretty productive when you're trying to make some choices, you know? Um, but I think, um, you know, as those lines are becoming publicly blurred of where information is coming from and where um, where people's motivations are, it's a lot harder to feel like you can trust the news organizations in your life or the media that you're reading. The thing that I would say about that is it's always been the case. You know, there's always been secret backroom conversations that have driven stories or uh, public announcements or governmental politics. It's just there's more time and space to talk about them now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and and you can become, you know, clearly people can become really effective really fast. You know, right. you, you talked about the um, the A B testing and and the work that you did with you know um, at Upworthy and you know and I hadn't thought like to the extent that uh, it had all been kind of programmed, like mm -hmm. like they, it was the the thoughtful yet. Um, intimidating process that you guys went through to make sure that the package was was presented properly. Right? Yeah, and you know, and if I think about um, the messaging that's going around now, especially as we're getting close to a presidential election, and if 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 everyone's just working on that package, knowing that hey, if I can get you to accept this, then when you're going to open it up and you're going to get the thing I really want you to get, right. 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 I mean, the interesting thing about that is in every other industry, data is um, used primarily in aggregate. You use big data, right? Um, and right now, journalism and media companies tend to use data story by story. So like, does this headline perform better than that headline? Does this, you know, if we put it in this part of the site, does it perform better than that part of the site? What I think is becoming really interesting and you know, for better or for worse, is just in the last couple of years, people are starting to use data in aggregate to make choices about what people are interested in, how they consume information. So there are data organizations that service journalism companies now who are able to pull historical data on, you know, two to five million publications globally and domestically and look at what's performing well and what's not and where there are demands for information that aren't being met or where people consistently enjoy the shape of a story versus not. The question then is how much do you use editorial judgment to cater to what people want versus work against it? You know, because people are always going to click on the thing that is a little bit more sensational right. because that's who we are as people. So do you use a sensational format to get people to eat their journalism broccoli? Mm -hmm. Or do you, as a, as a industry decide to move away from that altogether and retrain people to not look for that, you know? Um, and so I think there's a bunch of choices that are being made now, especially moving into election season of how to, how to get the right information, how to get correct information out um, to um, uh, news consumers that'll help them make better decisions and have them pay attention to it. And some of that can be like really um, mercenary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and some of it won't be. Um, I think the question is the good guys tend to never be as mercenary as the bad guys. Um, and um, there are there, you know, I don't know yet if you've talked about misinformation and disinformation at length on this podcast, no, but no. there are a lot of forces out there that are spreading misinformation and disinformation in a really mercenary way. Um, and they don't have any morals about how they're doing that. Right, <laughs> and so right. as, as research and data backed organizations who are trying to spread correct information, how far do you go to counter that? And where's the line? And I think that that's probably the frontier we'll be looking at this year. Um, as, especially as the elections come up, but it's not just the elections It's happening with the census. It's happening, um, globally with other countries, elections and governmental, um, issues.
issues. It's happening with political parties globally. Like this is not just a U.S. election issue. It's a it's a global issue that we're really just starting to realize is is happening around the world. Yeah, yeah. We we talk a little bit. We've talked a little bit in the past about you know some of the uh, you know the the spammers. Um, you know, they're sending out, you know, in the past have been sending out these requests for money. And, you know, if you send mm-hmm. us this money and we'll do this thing and mm-hmm. da, da, da. And it, it, we had this fantasy where if you were able to basically look at, like, they're actually pretty good marketers in a way. Oh, yeah. Like, like they're doing something right, right? People are giving them money. And if you were able to, to leverage that for good, like imagine what you could do. Well, I actually joke because in in a different part of my life, as I run this company and um and as I've built my career, I've been very interested in remote working and passive income. And I actually ran my business from a sailboat while sailing for a couple of years. So a lot of the work that I've done and the insights that I've had have been by looking at completely different industries and how they're building more effective, passively driven businesses yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then applying that to social impact, which has been the focus of my career. And, you know, what I tell clients is all of the information is there. Like we're not, I don't have a secret sauce. I'm just applying it very specifically to, um, to a world that's been constrained by, uh, goody two shoes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, for a long time. Yeah. I, I joke and call myself a social impact mercenary because if I see an algorithm that I can bend to my benefit, I'm going to do that, you know, because everyone else is. Yeah. Um, and so I think there are a lot of opportunities to do that across the board, but the question is, um, as you know, uh, as mainstream media loses trust with, uh, readership and, you know, there's been studies that say that, they are losing trust and that they aren't. So I say that with, with a grain of salt. Um, but if mainstream media is losing trust with readership, um, how much do you use data and psychology and, um, so social science, you know, to, to bring readers back into the fold and make them feel comfortable and held versus, maintaining what your core product has always been so that you can say that you're trustworthy. And I think that's the thing that people have not figured out yet. (laughs) But but you, you hit on something really interesting to that regard. You talked about this idea of, you know, these organizations moving towards becoming more of a community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, uh, you know, I'm a little late to the party, but I've been spending a lot of time on Reddit uh-huh. <laughs> um, because I'm not I, sure whether I should congratulate I, you I, or, I, I, but, 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 I've, you. but I've been, but I've been <laughs> focusing on only things that I'm interested in, yeah. in, in that, that interests me. Yeah. Right. And it's not even, it's not political stuff. It's like, you know, these TV shows, these cars, you know, these stereo systems oh, yeah. and it's hyper focused, but. And super helpful. Yeah, oh my gosh. Yeah. Man, it's not only interesting, but like, oh, I have that problem. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, and and a lot of them, I just, I don't even say anything. It's just interesting to watch people talk about the stuff. And, and, and so, uh, you know, I've tried to try to imagine like a world where you had that dynamic and you had that relationship and you had that built in trust because you believed that these were just other interested pe- people who were interested in the same things you're interested in. Right. You know, and, and yet, you know, at the same time, if I take someone's advice on Reddit, there is no warranty. Like they're not really an expert. Like I, I, I'm kind of like, okay, well I believe you, but versus an organization who's claiming no truth and accuracy and some kind of warranty, you know? Yeah. I, you know, it's funny that you bring that up because one of the questions that you sent me before, um, before we talked uh, today on this podcast was what is one of the best inventions of the last five to 10 years yeah. for you? And I, uh, for myself, I wasn't going to say this, but one of the things that has been most helpful to me is Facebook groups because it does essentially the same thing as Reddit does with a little bit more kindness, I would say, because you can kick people out of groups. Right. Um, (laughs) But um, I think one thing that's really amazing about self-organizing groups like that is that um, you no longer have to depend on your physical friends and family as your source of information for for the things that you're passionate and interested about. Um, When it comes to intellectual pursuits that can get really scary right so if you're um if you're in a you know extreme political viewpoint group 
Um, you're going to create an echo chamber within that group that very quickly is going to normalize some behaviors that perhaps are not productive for right. society. On the flip side, um, if you are an urban gardener and you're trying to get off the grid while living in the city, like you're going to be also able to, to move very quickly into the direction of your dream. And so, you know, I've seen, especially as someone who's worked remotely predominantly over the last 10 years, the amount of connections and help I've been able to receive from those groups, um, just in, the things that are interesting to me when oftentimes I'm, you know, in the middle of nowhere and join my life in a beautiful place, but without a on the ground community, that's been super helpful. Um, I think what's interesting about how to apply that to journalism organizations is journalists don't consider their community peers um, or their readership peers rather. And I was actually very surprised. I went to a um, talk at NPR's headquarters in DC a couple of weeks ago um, and they were talking about some, they had some podcasters who were, um, who were speaking about how they grew their podcast. And it was sort of like an industry fireside chat, super interesting. But one of the things that, um, one of the podcasters mentioned was that she was in a coffee shop in Portland and her barista was a member of her Facebook group. Um, and the barista freaked out and right. was really excited to meet her. And she was like, I can't wait to tell everybody in the group, they're going to lose their minds. And like, did you see this and that and the other that we talked about this week? And the podcaster did not participate in that group at all. And she was like, I knew we had some super fans, but it was really surprising to see them in real life. And to me, that feels like such an opportunity that traditional journalism hasn't quite captured yet. There's They're using communities as um, amplification vectors, you know, where the super fans take the things that they make and share it like crazy, but they're not yet using their audience as... Um, contributors to the next story or the big idea uniformly. I think some yeah. organizations do that better than others, but that's where you get those like super engaged folks moving forward, big ideas in a faster way because you're, you're in a vacuum, but you're in a much bigger vacuum of people with different ideas as opposed to a single podcasting studio. Yeah. I think that offers a huge opportunity, both in perspective and broadening um, content to what people really care about, um, especially with niche operations, mm -hmm. um, because that's where you tend to see those super fan bases. Um, and it also allows you to think of new ways of using, um, data, you know, like collecting information from them, um, looking at where those people are coming from and serving their areas better, um, asking them what's important to them and sort of standardizing over time the way that you're reporting. Like there's a lot of really cool, interesting things you can do with that when you're yeah. building a community in that way. Yeah. I mean, the, the word that comes to mind as you're describing this is, is a relationship. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's, um, Journalists have big egos and it's hard sometimes to admit that the people that they're serving are as smart as they are, you right. know? Um, and, and I think that's one reason why specific bloggers and podcasters have become really popular because they're much more accessible than traditional journalists with a capital J, yeah, you know? Yeah. Victoria, this has been super enlightening. Um, you know, I, I think I could talk to you for another hour easily <laughs> um, if, if we didn't have to cut. But, you know, I, I really appreciate you coming on and spending some time with us. And uh, it would be great if you could come back. Yeah, I would love that. Thank oh, you so awesome. much. I love talking nerdy about journalism. Yeah. So this is great. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. <laughs> Thanks. You've been listening to Brave New Data, the Data Economics Podcast, presented by Lydian Research. I'm your host, Rob McGray. Our guest is Victoria Fine. We're shot and edited by Tough Town, sound designed by Alfred Montejano. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe where all great podcasts can be found. Thanks, and have a great one.